Hey everyone, so today we have with me uh, Benjamin Harrell. Uh, I think we met a couple of times, maybe through uh, Metcon, uh, for example. He did one of the, I think one of the events. And right now- I was actually one of the opening- me. Yeah. Sorry, I was actually one of the opening interviews um, from Hamza when MAD was launched. So yeah, it's been a while, but <laughs> good to try and be back online again. <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was awesome, yeah. Same here. So I think for those who do not know you, I think some may not know. <laughs> Just give a, give a little background about what you do, uh, where you're from, uh, what you're doing right now. So I'm from the United Kingdom, specifically England. I am a recent graduate of the Leicester School of Architecture. I'm the project author of Vessels of Penryn, which is a project focused on climate displacement, flood defense infrastructure, and conservation of place. It's uh, it's done very well for itself as a thesis project. It's been nominated for the RBA Silver Medal and it's, uh, it's diamond and its crown as it will be presented at the Dubai 2020 World Expo. Cool. So for those who do not know what your thesis, I think is quite uh, a big focus of your, your practice and right now, uh, you're, you're passionate about it. So we want to share about why you're passionate about <laughs> Like mitigating the effects of climate displacement, uh, what, 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 where did it come from? What's the concern that you had? Well, I mean, so, as a bit of a project background, it started off in my first year of masters, where in about January time, I found a news article uh, from the BBC, which was highlighting that the settlement in Wales was soon to be the first um, place, basically, to be evacuated due to climate change which meant that the UK had its first climate refugees and the terminology refugee in the UK is quite a, a polarizing one. It's something that we'd normally associate with other countries being a very well developed country ourselves. So the idea of that we're having to have people flee from our own um, internal crisis is quite, quite unsettling to a lot of people. You don't, as I say, you don't associate that terminology with the UK itself. And what's really shocking is that this isn't just one settlement is going to happen to. It's going to happen to multiple settlements around the UK itself. In Wales alone, there's 40 other coastal villages earmarked for the same treatment of Fairbourne, which is decommissioning, which is where the whole infrastructure and building material has to be removed from the site. And what that means is that many people will be losing their homes and their communities in the near future. And we need to start exploring remedies for this because realistically the timeline for Fairbourne being decommissioned is 40 years and within about um, 50 years itself, the whole settlement would be completely flooded and use, useless. So as an island nation with multiple communities and even cities that are coastal at risk of sea level rise, we need to start preparing for this big change in our infrastructure. So I guess that was a very, like a wake up call per se for you guys? I think so. It was a wake up like call having, having... for me personally. Yeah, it was a wake up call for me cool. personally. Um, it was a case of I wanted so, more people so, so. to actually be aware of this issue. Mm. Yeah. So do you, how, what were the challenges you faced when you're crafting the your thesis and like the, the approach to, to this problem? Like what were the things you considered? So the first thing was to analyze all the threats that are happening to this village. And it became very quick that just the height of the water wasn't the only issue. In particular, the main danger became from when storms happen happened. So recently Fairborn's flood defense at seawall has been overtopped by an aggressive storm, meaning that um, houses behind have been damaged. And so to say, it's not about the sea level rising, it's about the impact of the waves that are going to come in and actually destroy infrastructure and top over the sea wall. And what's going to happen with climate change on top of this is that storms will become more frequent, more aggressive, which means bigger waves and more damage, which can also lead to loss of human life in the end. And so we really need to start focusing on how we're going to sort of amend this as an issue. And this isn't just a local problem. Once again, it was Professor Jim Hall from Oxford, who was quoted in The Guardian as saying that around the UK, most of our flood defenses are going to expire in the next 20 years, which will have to be paid out of the taxpayer's pocket through the Chancellor's budget. 
and this is going to be very difficult for us to afford as a nation, especially after all the COVID issues we've just had and all the pay payouts that have happened. I think for, for us in Singapore right now, that that is the the main thing, right? There's a lot of issues that we are facing as a country in Singapore that uh that is regarding climate change and climate displacement. Right. For example, I think in Singapore the weather is quite uh, intense. Uh there's different uh seasons of like, you know, very hot, very very cold, like a lot of heavy rain, uh flood risk is actually happening in Singapore right now. I think recently, last month, there was like a case where I think one of the expressways had a huge flood and then it, it jammed out a lot of vehicles uh, because of the, the drainage issues. Uh, things about so I'm, having too hot sometimes. I've only been, I've mm -hmm. actually had the privilege of going to Singapore. Yeah, um, I've had the privilege of going to Singapore and I think one of Singapore's issues is going to be the amount of um, impermeable land mass that's going to happen. So. This is the same for most coastal settlements itself. But if a, a storm or the tide rising in itself also coincides with heavy flooding, so, sorry, heavy rainfall, what it's going to do is that's going to create a lot of ground water because the water itself can't drain away as easily. So it's only going to exacerbate flooding further. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a very interesting mm -hmm. issue for Singapore. But you've also got really heavily developed coastal areas. So you have the gardens by the bay, of course, which I think in itself seems to form a natural, which I wouldn't be surprised if it formed a natural flood defence as well. I think, mm. like with yep. my thesis, it's focusing on yeah, more a lot of rural, underdeveloped areas. Yeah, I think in terms of the uh, approach that we're trying to do, I think it's a mixture of like soft, soft and hard measures. Uh, I think we're trying. I think firstly they're trying to actually build like sea walls around, which is like. Ideally, not the, not the best way to do it, but we are trying, we are exploring the methods of like reducing it from the very uh, source of it, like the the coastal areas, right? Because that's one of the main uh, locations that, like, firstly the the water can come in from the the, the sea. Secondly, it's also when you mentioned like drainage uh, design in Singapore, and like having ensuring that there's enough adequate like capacity for the flow to get out. Uh, but I think more and more we're thinking about how do we live, how do we adapt to the situation instead of like keep on building uh, wider drains, uh, uh, more detention tanks, a lot of different hard measures uh, that are in place to to mitigate the effects of flood flooding. Uh, I think we're trying to explore, for example, like maybe di uh, absorbing water like into the ground instead of diverting and channeling it in a way. So that could be one option. Uh, I think we're still exploring what is the best for Singapore in terms of the cost, uh, the environmental cost, the social cost of developing all of these systems. And do we keep on expanding the, the, the drain size? I don't think we should because there's so many. We keep amending the, like for example, I think for Singapore, there's a lot of new regulations about flood risk because uh, as the levels rise, we're actually trying to, uh, us architects to actually increase their platform level so the, the higher and higher it gets and then it may not be the best way to solve the problem because uh, you are required to build a building that's like maybe two meters above the driveway eventually which is not <laughs> ultimately that's not going to be the best <laughs> yeah so things like this i mean it, it used to be a good solution but i think now we're at the crossroads of choosing what do we do as a nation do we uh, keep on going the same direction or do you have to think about it in a different way? So, I so think I'm not sure about in the UK. About... Uh, is there any... You talked hmm. about it earlier, but you said about seawalls not being particularly good and they're effective to a certain point, but when they get overtopped, they're then useless. And the other thing with all these harder infrastructures is that they need maintenance and repair. And so I'm not sure if there is going to be an easy, you do it once type strategy. But for example, in New York, they've started putting down oyster reef beds again, which will end up sort of dissipating the waves energy as it comes in. So you'll be more protected from storms, but it doesn't help the rising water levels itself. But this is what my project was really trying to explore about was the new adaptive typology. And the thing is, is you've, we've got to think about how extreme sea level rise is actually going to be. So you can have a base layer where 
you go, we're going to be safe for 10 years, 20 years and 30 years. And so what my typology ended up being was you have this, um, you have a base which was meant to be flooded. So you had this in for, like, formal public area, public landscape, which I ended up turning into tidal gardens, which then sort of flooded as the sea levels rise and then drained naturally. And so what that does is that creates an adaptable landscape that was future proof for my own estimations for about 80 years, which is hopefully when we get to a constant point of sea level rise, but you might want to have to future proof it further. And then there was an upper deck, which was going to be consistently safe and dry from even the storms itself. And so it is about exploring a new typology to um, basically deal with flooding landscapes. And one of the huge criticisms I had about my project was about the amount of resource that was used and how sort of how how could you actually implement it along a lot of areas without using such mass amounts of material and i think it was a very valid point but the whole point of my project for me was not to ever suggest that we build this but to actually get a conversation started because we do need to explore a new typology for coastal settlements the uk itself is a very land scarce area we don't have the space to just relocate families we already have a housing crisis people don't even want to move from their communities and that's what this project is about to explore It's a lot of similarities that we see also in Singapore, like having a land scarce uh, problem as well. I think in Singapore, we also have a housing crisis per se because of COVID. Uh, there's a lot of disruption with the the supply chain of the construction of the buildings. Because we do operate in the model that we build, uh, we design first, and we build first, and then we sell it later. So basically, no, sorry, they actually buy first and then we build it for them. For them. So literally, uh, Singaporeans are actually uh, balloting for the houses uh, in advance mm. before it's being constructed. So that is a bit, and I think it did work for a moment before pre-COVID because uh, when we have the number people who actually booked for their flats, and then Singapore, the government can actually plan for the construction of the flats in like let's say uh, mm. four or five years later, and then they get the keys. So right now there's a problem because there's a lot of uh, like projects that are being stalled due to COVID, and that there's a lot of young families who are looking for houses, but there aren't any as well. So there's a lot of uh, issues that we are trying to tackle, and also trying to see what's the best way to do it. But you also mentioned about uh, uh, the the idea of the, for example, the sea walls, right? There's also, uh, it works in certain sense, and then when you say it, it, it doesn't work when it's being topped over. So that that's a, it's a stop gap measure because uh, there's also, on the one hand, it does stop prevent uh, a future uh, flood risk in maybe like five years, but beyond that, we do have to think of other ways to, to adapt and live with the different risk and the different climate changes that we're going to face inevitably because well, we are. The way would, we are going, I would say it's about gonna be, sustainability yeah. with seawalls, and it's the idea of that mm -hmm. if you build a seawall and it continues to rise, it's going to not only need maintenance but it's going to need expanding. And my key word here is is sustainability. I don't know all the logistics, and I'll be very honest, I'm very young with the profession, but I have a big fear that one day we will run out of resource, and in particular, people don't realise how devastating to the environment concrete is it absolutely destroys landscapes and it pollutes like hell and if we just keep relying on concrete manufacturing we're not going to be in a good place in a hundred years time and that's my issue with seawalls is that you're depending on a material resource which is actually damaging our planet and we will r eventually run out of material so is it wise to actually put all of our eggs in that basket so to speak it's just a case of, I think we need to have softer, sustainable implementations where it's not just about building more and more and more just to keep our problem away because a new problem that's more disastrous is going to catch up. And the other really big thing about seawalls is, is once they fail, they cause more damage than the initial flood would because you have this sudden impact of water coming over. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's very true. I think uh, we do have to think about a lot of the different uh, like effects we think about something. Not only the short-term effects, like what you mentioned, like also the long-term effects. And yeah, I agree with you that CWAS is not the solution per se. And I hope, I mean, I think they're also studying, my government's studying also how, what is the best way forward with regards to this uh, idea of the, like the flood risk and the temperatures rising. Yeah. And talking about materials, it's quite an interesting debate because uh, I think you're moving towards a lot of different uh, new materials for building. Uh, for example, I think in Singapore, we're trying to explore a uh, match engineered timber, MET. I think that could be one of the, the alternatives for, for structural elements. The other one is like uh, using uh, kind of like the eco material, like maybe you're exploring like, I don't know, some like mushrooms or, you know, they kind of like that kind of, that kind of frontier where they're exploring biological materials. So that I feel that maybe we give it I don't know, maybe five to ten years for MET to be more more prevalent. Uh, but we're also thinking about the future, like glass, like future, the future concrete, like what is going to be the new uh, standard, right? And concrete, I mean, there's also new advances in like the kind of concrete that we used. So I feel that giving, given maybe more research, uh, more time, I think over over maybe five, ten years, it's going to be very interesting how we architects to adapt to a new form of building material palette. So I wanted, I wanted to I, know yeah, what I you think about agree. this this new hmm, like this new idea of this new uh, selection of materials and then uh, what do you think about all of these coming when how do you see this coming into play and how do you think it's gonna mitigate the, the impacts? So I really hope to start off with that um, we're going to go for a big material revolution. I'm in particular a really big fan of rammed earth for its low carbon emissions itself. The idea is that you could take part of the site and then make it into the building itself. I think it's not only poetically beautiful, but is a lot more sustainable. This is only for much smaller scales though. And I think in places like Singapore, that's not going to be the solution, but I'm thinking for more, um, for more rural countries such as the UK itself, I think that's a really good way forward. But sustainability is such an interesting concept as well, because I think most of my education in sustainability is making your building more efficient, but never thinking about what it's made of. Hmm. And this is one of the real big things I have with sort of how we've been taught is that we keep saying like, we need to make our buildings more efficient. Natural daylighting, it's wonderful. We know it does great for our moods. But what it ends up doing is, is we end up saying, my building's for not as bad as this building. We only go, we're not as bad as this, we're not as bad as this. We never actually actively go, let's try and make something that's good. And I think that's going to be, that's something I'm particularly interested in myself as well as that with material circular economy. The idea of, can we make a, a carbon negative building can we make a a building that's mm. actually a positive attribute to its surroundings rather than just going oh it doesn't need to be heated as much might not be as big of an issue in singapore but heating is one of our really big issues in the uk we're trying to insulate all of our houses on a national level trying to change all our single glazing pane windows to double glazing because of our fuel expenditure in the winter mm. but what we really need to do is i think is we need to Think about, yes, our energy consumption, but the materials we use just as much. As a nation, the UK is moving more and more close towards green energy. I could be really, really arrogant and even say something like, I think potentially within the next 30 to 40 years in the UK, green energy won't necessarily, or sorry, sourcing green energy might not be a big problem. So energy expenditure won't be our issue. It will be our carbon emissions from actually constructing the buildings itself, which will have a huge impact. So it's changing our concrete post beam structures to, as you say, an engineered timber and then in the field with rammed earth, where basically we're not having to mine out a, um, a sea quarry in Norway, ship it over, ship the limestone over to the UK to grind it up to then be made into a building. We can try and source our materials locally. The RBA have started doing a wonderful lecture series uh, called Architecture New that actually is trying to really explore this. And one of the speakers even talked about how to grow a building. 
And it wasn't just, you know, you grow a tree and you chop it down. It was how to make things like new engineered concretes out of hemp. So it could really be something interesting in our future. The idea of you grow your building on site. Well, sorry, you grow the materials for your building on site and then you construct it out of locally sourced things rather than saying like traditionally when we say locally sourced materials in the UK, we talk about, oh, the slates from down the road. Slates still extracting a natural resource. You can only take so much out of the mountains before they're gone. We need to really focus on what is renewable resources in terms of our building strategies. Yeah, that's a very good point about carbon emissions while constructing, like the embodied carbon within the materials, right? Uh, and for example, if you're talking about concrete, there's no carbon inside at all. Uh, it's being ex expanded uh, per se. And I think Singapore, like what you said, in the UK is trying to heat up the building. For us, it's trying to cool down the building in, in terms of course, mm -hmm. it's hot outside. And there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of buildings currently in Singapore that we are using a lot of air conditioning uh, to cool out the in internals. And I think, I think we're moving towards, I think there was a breakthrough in, I think in the recent year, we're trying our best to also make it a, a law, right? Like there's going to be a new code or building code, I think in next year for us, they were trying to, to move everybody, new buildings, new projects going to be more, uh, sustainable in many different aspects. I, I, I won't talk, I won't go into detail here because there's a lot, of, a lot of different things to talk <laughs> about like uh, thermal, the thermal side of things. We're talking, talking about the embodied common. We're talking about CFD, natural ventilation. We're talking about uh, the lighting. So there's a lot of different aspects, and it's a lot of. I think for architects, we are trying our best to actually, uh, like make these uh indicators of sustainability more concrete and also more uh clear to future architects, right? Because it's gonna be a necessity for us now because i think previously when in 2000s nobody really cared about the climate but in 2020 and 2021 i think there's a greater emphasis of this in the building design and in singapore they're trying also to to make it a legis legislative uh uh law to to start uh, designing buildings based on these guidelines and i think over in the next five to ten years it's going to be even more strict <laughs> yeah it's going to be more strict and i hope the the industry can actually work together to make it more sustainable as well. I think we, we just need to be more collaborative in general. So I, I think, think... Order... Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, I think we need to be more collaborative mm -hmm. in general as a practice. And I think the commercialization of architecture is slightly dangerous. I'm really in danger of sounding hideously left wing here. But if we have all been taught the same ideals about sustainability and how important it needs to be, we need to actually start working together a bit more. So one of the really interesting things is that you have companies that specialized in round earth construction or untreated timber construction, which are things that are really beneficial for the local environment, the environment in general, they also create really lovely buildings. But the thing is, is that they don't need, they don't want to disclose necessarily that information of how we construct and how to building out of these materials, because it is a business model. And that's something that is quite, it feels very contradictory. It's like, we want to save the planet, but we still want to make money out of it, which I think is completely fine. I think you do need to monetize your skills, but we also need to ramp up this level of eco-friendly construction. And this kind of is one of my big opinions about architecture school at the moment is that I really think we need to start implementing green construction strategies right from the off. So rather than your bread and butter sort of um, construction methods being concrete and steel. Why don't we try and just teach round earth and timber using good precedence that's already around to a younger generation? That way, when they come to eventually design a building in practice for the first few times, or they get to a director level, their comfortability is going to be within those sorts of material palettes, and we're going to be much more sustainable as a whole. Yeah, the, the idea of bringing what we have learning in in the industry right now bringing that less lessons to the education level i think it's very important especially when we are going to to pass on the baton to them right they are going to be the one to use the materials i mean forced to use the materials like they, they are no longer being able to use concrete and and steel 
and glass so why, why are we still trying to you know teach them the conventional methods of building and i think in maybe like what you said in the next five to ten years it's going to be a greater emphasis of these alternative materials so i was really lucky that i had one of my first ever um tutors i can remember i just did your classic form finding exercise in my first year and he went to me oh what's it made out of and i just went concrete and he was just like you can't like you can just do that but you can't just do that anymore you need to really think about it and this is why i feel very passionate about the subject is because it feels like such a default you before you even enter architecture school if you go on grand designs or you see most architectural images it's some it's a concrete box of some description and you go oh that looks lovely and they do they do look lovely but the the thing is that we can't keep doing that anymore those projects were conceived in the time where concrete was a new innovation and we didn't understand all of the downsides of this material and now we're understanding more and more that can't be our default i think we need to replace big form works like that with round earth once again or hempcrete or some form of substitute where you actually know what you're going to be making rather than creating a form and saying it's concrete you actually have to think about the material sustainability of it its viability of construction i think for the the challenge we face as an industry is like because i'm, I'm working on public housing projects like high rise so a lot of the projects that we do are currently using precast and prefabricated uh, as well so sometimes that we do the the precast off, off site and then we carry bring it all the way to the site and we construct it uh, i think the challenge right now is like if using ram earth for example that the material is still we need to find a way to make it uh, like, a, like conventional concrete use form work right you use form work to create the, the slab the walls and to make it as flat as possible or as straight as possible uh, but we I think with using alternative materials like that, like ramp earth, we need to actually see how can we uh, scale it up in that sense. Because if you want oh, yeah, to, I wouldn't use say it, concrete sure, you for a small house, for, no problem. Yeah, concrete is definitely not for skyscrapers. Or, and this is part of the conversation I think we need to have more as well. I think in some cases, concrete will be more than justified as a usable material, but we also need to mitigate its downsides, and we need to think about smarter material choices. Mm. So. Once again, going back to my thesis, I used a lot of concrete in that. I'll put my hands up and say it. Yeah, admittedly, I did try to like offset this by saying the limestone is going to be made out of locally harvested oyster shells, which are used to help protect the Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of different ideas about how we we practice and how do we, you know, construct things, you know, how do we what materials do we use? Uh, there's a lot of different things we had to talk about as a global community of architects. And I feel that this platform that we have, right, like sharing knowledge between you and I, or even between architects of different countries and uh, research researchers and practitioners, students, there's a lot of uh, opportunities there to kind of get together firstly and to share the different knowledge that we have. And I feel that this is one of the best ways to, to move forward because I think we can we can go on forever like we can talk about this forever like we can actually debate about it like, but ultimately what is going to happen is I think it is going to be a case where we need to sit down together and talk about it like as a whole community and also to share as much as possible what we discover by using the materials and the research that we are currently doing for example for other like maybe profession, professors who are trying to explore materials uh, who are trying to explore methods like 3D printing, uh, different technologies like ro robot robotics, and how do we we move forward and take the leap to totally steer away from like concrete and the conventional building materials and methods? So that I feel uh, personally is the way I think forward. I agree completely. And yeah, I'm quite glad to actually talk, talk to you about this because actually, like I, we're in the golden age now, I think, where information is going to be so easily to transpose. Yeah. You now so, have people all over the world connecting with each other. I was talking to a boy who saw um, <laughs> one of my Instagram posts and just decided to message me today about what type of architect you want to be. And that's a really weird question. And I think a lot of people hadn't even considered that before. I only think about it myself because of a podcast I had previously listened to where it was a scaffold podcast with Mary Duggan. I'd really recommend it. It was, 
been really highly influential into how I've decided to move my career forward. And it is about like, what kind of architect do you want to be? You know, you do specialize, you do have to have certain values at the end of the day. If you go through architecture school, knowing you want to be a certain type of architecture, I think you're going to have a much more rewarding time than just trying to generalize. So that's why we, we have to sit together and yeah, we have, there's no other way to, to solve the problem because it's such a big problem and it requires a lot of parties to be together, like the builders, designers, researchers, architects, even the, the government. Yeah. So I think that is like what we can, can conclude from this discussion. Yeah, I think we just need to be more collaborative. We need to share our information. So I just want to shift yeah. gears a little bit. Yeah, we we'll shift just a little bit to the education side of things. Uh, I just wanted to understand, like, I mean, based on your own experience, how do you feel? Was there any uh, like gaps that you realized that could have been addressed during your education or in practice? So in the UK, in my education in particular, I think there is a definite technical disconnect. I like this is one of our big issues, and I think everyone feels it throughout quite um, a lot. <laughs> throughout mo most of architectural education. But my opinions on education changed a lot over the last two years. So when I went to go study my master's at the School of Architecture, I had the privilege of assisting to teach Design Studio One for first year students, where I, was, I wasn't I was a tutor in myself, I was a tutor's assistant. And I basically had a day where I would sit down with students who would come talk to me about issues they felt like they were having from their dialogue with tutors themselves. And being a student, you understand the issues a lot more closely at hand, and you don't realize how much you learn over your whole undergrad to your masters. And a lot of architecture school in itself is learning how to do architecture school. I will completely admit that part of my thesis in itself was designed to be a very appealing thing for an architecture school. And that's like a whole other conversation in itself. But when students come to you and they go, my tutors asked me or told me to do this, and I don't understand why, that's really, really confusing. People don't normally see it that way. It's like, so what is site analysis and why do I do it? Why is it important? And I think a lot of the times we miss out the, the lesson of why we do something. And so site analysis, any practitioner will tell you it's really important to engage your local council or committee to get approval for your building when you want to build it but it can seem like such an arbitrary first step when you walk into architecture school you go i'm here to design buildings and you're making me draw a few facades and tell me what the sense of place is like it doesn't seem to make sense so i think there needs to be a lot more clarity in the confusion of architecture school and so i'm a really big fan now of um, a mentoring systems Yep, like mentoring is really important in terms of like having someone to someone more senior to guide you, but also having the opportunity to teach somebody to reinforce the learning. So I, I totally agree with you in terms of like having the one of the best ways to address the gap is for us to maybe for us right now when we are practicing, we are already graduated and we can actually start to engage the younger ones to, to share what we've learned. Because back when we were younger, I think we also wish there was somebody senior to share with with us, like what they learned and how can we, you know, improve the way we design architecture. So yeah, def that's the definite uh, way to do it. Like other than knowledge, knowledge sharing between the different stages, uh, like in, in education, those who are studying and with the people who are actually doing the work now in the industry. And that's really important. I think that's it. We actually need to not just have a tutors who come in from industry to teach i think we need to have other practitioners who are just there to give you much more bread and butter this is why we do things the way we do um even in my new job now i was doing concept diagrams to explain what i was doing to a treatment of a facade of an old cinema building and how i was trying to take it some um, existing features and just slightly tweak them so that they could work as a viable commercial unit because you still have to make your design viable at the end of the day in practice. And that's a really big thing. 
And because this wasn't, it wasn't a heritage asset, but it was a valuable building of the local area. Really lovely cinema. It was designed in the Art Deco era. Um, so the local council were going to really be quite precious about this. And it's like, I just want to explain to you how I'm trying to make this viable for its restoration, whilst also making it viable in terms of for the developer to actually make it into the units they require. And so I basically ended up pulling out the facade and doing your classic like VR Kingle steps. And I think like your concept diagrams like that are going to be so good in your professional portfolio, but you never know this. I think that's actually a really interesting point I accidentally stumbled across. It's having someone from the industry tell you what's actually good to see in your portfolio, what can be applicable for industry. So my portfolio is really, really tailored to the skills I have and what I can offer at practice. And so you have things like model making, sketching, your visualizations, your CAD drawings. Those all show your skills and that's what you need to have in your portfolio. But if you've just graduated and you haven't had any contact with people in industry, you don't know what your portfolio is meant to look like. You don't know what's actually good to have in there. You just kind of throw in all your projects and hope they like it. Whereas your portfolio needs to demonstrate a skill set rather than just look at all the projects I've done. Yeah, I think for those listening who are students, you know, who are about to graduate and about to find a job, I think it's very important to, I think firstly, to get connections with other people who are like, like what you mentioned, like who are you working and maybe like a wider network, not just only one, one senior who's, you know, very well, but also multiple people in different firms who are trying their best to, to share with you uh, what they learned in their own practice. And the portfolio wise, I feel that, you know, ultimately it's like a dating profile, you know, like you, you need to, to put in the best part of yourself and to showcase it and to see how it relates to their perspective and how they practice architecture and their visions and their their job, like their project scope. Like what do they, do they only do industrial or do they only do residential and how can you tailor that? It's a lot about answering to that that, that brief, like knowing your, your prospective employer, what they are going to do. And so it isn't just about showing your projects and just saying, this is what I do, but more about mm. how can I help how can I give add value to the company and, and how can I, uh, be a part of this shared vision that maybe through a project that maybe it's a similar, similar idea or similar process, similar design process or similar type of typology. So I feel that, that for those who are listening right now, who are like interest, interested in understanding how, what to do with a portfolio and how to, to cater it and make it like impactful and also appealing to the prospective employer so that I, my advice is just to actually make it to fully understand like wh who they are and what, what they're doing and it's like it's basically like tinder right you just need to put a profile and make sure that you i think all the developing on from you you should what you're be, saying, yourself. My, like some of my personal advice is so i'm about to start work for one of my dream practices actually is um tailor make your portfolio to the practice you want to be in because not every practice has the same values. You're very right in saying it's like a dating profile. I had a general portfolio I sent out to a lot of different places and people. And then I had ones which were tailor-made where I knew they would appreciate certain works more. I emphasized that differently. It's a case of like, you know, if you really, really want a job at a very certain practice, know what they like and try to appeal to them, but also try to add value. What can you do that's more for them than they already do try and like you know see what they see what their interests are and try and do one better and it might not be easy i in all honesty over the past two years i did two extra projects inside of my masters just to buffer up my portfolio into what my actual interests were because i didn't realize it until my last year of education which sounds well <laughs> it was a very tough year but because of that I've had really insightful conversations with many different potential mm -hmm. employers, and I'm now really happy with where I'm about to end up. Yeah, it sounds really exciting for you, and I can't wait to hear more about your, your projects, your stories uh, in the future. I just really, really, you know, I'm grateful to have a conversation with you about sustainable design and uh, climate change and how we architects can actually play a part and also about portfolio design. 
So is there anything that we want you want to, to raise like any issues and opportunities about the education and practice of architecture? Like just um, before the last words of advice would be trying to teach like um sorry let me start again. I'd say you want architecture to be a team sport, not an individualist. In architecture school, it's very easy to keep your head down and go, my idea is I want to be the best. And it might not work for all teaching systems, but if you be more collaborative with everyone else, we're all going to benefit further. Share your knowledge and share your resources and help each other out because at the end of the day, you're all just going to benefit from working collaboratively. And it's really easy, as I say, to try to be selfish and self-focused during architecture school. Yeah, because I think architecture is so broad and so wide, I no no single human can actually absorb the full scope of the the knowledge and you no. Know, so the best way is just to be open and share the knowledge. Like what I'm trying to do with our book, right? Trying to share as much as possible because I mean by by sharing knowledge you can actually so reinforce the learning. And I think that's the best way to understand, to truly What's understand the really concept. What's going to be really interesting about our book it. is this will end up being you embodied. In my eyes, I see as, an, as a designer, you're only as good as your visual catalogue. You can only ever take reference and precedence from more and more different things. So the more you share and the more you look at other things, the better design you will be because you'll be more aware of more and more solutions. So it's going to be really interesting if you say, ever say there is going to be a finished art blog book or if it's a continue encyclopedia of everyone you've come across and shared knowledge it's going to make you a very wise man in the end i think <laughs> yeah so i mean like i can share right now that i'm trying to do it a book like basically the idea is that whatever i've compiled, compiled so far on our book I actually cleaned up a little bit on the ig so you don't see much of it but the idea is to to compile it to a book and and also trying to, because right now I'm trying to also mm. get my license. So, I've, so I'm also studying like contract law. I'm studying like uh, the practice of like, contract administration, uh, site administration, or and even like uh, building codes and all the different acts and statutes. So all this will come into play. I think I'm trying to to organize it and look forward to to sharing it with you guys in the next year onwards. So there's a lot of things in the works that I, I will <laughs> keep it now and keep it a suspense uh, i think like ultimately my goal is to you know to to yeah like me embody it like this is this is me like, whatever I've, I've learned i try my it, best it's basically it going to be a download of your brain which is going to be and it also helps me <laughs> yeah yeah like it's like a personal brand as well i feel that uh the architects in, there's a lot of architects in singapore so my that's also my own personal uh goal is to actually is to, like be a different architect a different type like, of mm, architect basically uh, sharing architect like to share as much as possible what i've learned yeah is to stand up from the rest so i look forward to share this with you guys in the next year look forward to yeah. reading it thank you so thank you so much ben thank you so much for, for thank joining you. it's been me. a pleasure thank you for having me yeah all right bye-bye all right take care